Hey guys, and welcome back to another quick video, this time about a Kotlin language feature that many people probably have heard about, but most people don't know about what that really does under the surface. And that feature is called inlining. So in Kotlin, we do have this inline keyword, we do have the cross inline keyword, which isn't applicable here, but you can see it is a keyword. We do have the no inline keyword. So in this video, I will go over all of these and over all of those scenarios where inlining might be really beneficial. So you understand what this really does behind the scenes and why that might be useful for certain functions, variables or classes. So first of all, what I want to do is I want to create a normal function. This function can be called on any type of list. So let's just have a generic argument here and we then say, normal for each. As you probably know, every single list has that um, for each function, which just iterates over the list and then gives us access to this Lambda function here, which grants us access on every single item uh, this for loop iterates over. And in here to implement our own kind of implementation of this function, we are just going to have a for loop where we say for each item in this, so in our list that we iterate over, we just want to execute our action Lambda with the current item we're iterating over. And if we then construct some kind of list here, let's say from one to 100, we convert this range to a list, then we can say um, actually list.normal for each, and we simply print every single number. If we execute this here, you can see uh, that result is not surprising that we just get one print line statement for every single number we are iterating over. But inlining now becomes relevant when we actually take a look at the generated bytecode behind this function. And we can easily do this in Android Studio or IntelliJ, which I'm currently in here, under Tools, Kotlin, Show Kotlin Bytecode, and then we can click on Decompile, because then we see what is really a decompile to so the actual Java code from that Kotlin bytecode. Here you can see we do have a main function, we do have our normal for each function, and in our main function, we first of all declare our list and then we execute our normal for each function with our list and with a lambda parameter. So the lambda in our case is really just what we put inside here. A lambda in Kotlin is really nothing else than an object like um, a string or some kind of class instance. But this is important. Remember this code that here we have a function call. If we now go ahead in our normal for each function and we actually, let's just copy this and we call this inlined for each and we add this inline keyword, and we then go ahead in our main function and we replace this normal for each with inline for each, and then decompile this again, you will notice that our main function suddenly looks a little bit differently. So while with our normal for each function, I think we can still see this here, with our normal for each function, our main function just consist consisted of those two lines. We had a function call to normal for each, and the implementation of normal for each um, is just something here with a while loop, some kind of iterator, and then we just call this uh, invoke function on our Lambda with the, with the current item we're iterating over. Now in our inline for each function, you can see the implementation of the function is exactly the same. Oops. But what this inline keyword will now do is it will take this source code of our, of our inline for each function and wherever we call this inline for each function, it will now copy paste the source code. So here in our main function, instead of having a real function call, the source code of our inline function is inlined. So it will be pasted in our main function where we call it. So here we call uh, inline for each, and this is exactly the um, function body source code of our inline function. So here we don't really have a real function call under the hood anymore, but the compiler will just go ahead and say, okay, I am going to grab this code because it's an inline function and copy paste this in here with the list that we are actually iterating over. And then I'm going to print each item. This is what will really happen under the hood here made by the compiler. So why would this be useful? Well, because calling a function has a cost. And if we inline a function, especially inlining a function with a lambda that is uh, very frequently called with a little code, like just printing something in here, because very often if we have a follow, we're not doing a lot with every single iteration with every single item. So this action lambda is called a lot of time. So we have a lot of function calls here. So one in every single iteration. And if we now inline this, we get rid of all those function calls. So for functions like this for each function, Function that takes in a lambda or also for this map function. So if we would go ahead and say list.map and then actually take a look at the documentation of this map function, 
then you also see that it is a public inline function because this transform lambda here will very likely be called a lot of times on an iterable. So this inline keyword isn't really something that will change the behavior of our code, but what will happen with this code under the hood when it's compiled. However, this might not only be useful for functions that actually take in a lambda function that is called very frequently, but also for functions where the function itself is likely to be called very frequently and does not contain a lot of code. Some typical examples we can find in the Kotlin math implementation. So if we say, Kotlin x, uh, just Kotlin dot math. And for example, we take the square root function where calculating a square root of a certain number is something that does not require a lot of code very likely, but that is something that is very often executed a lot of times in a loop, for example, where you have to do a lot of calculations with a lot of items. So small function body, frequent use, that hints towards an inline. And you can see that's exactly what the authors of this function did. This is um, an inline function, even though this function does not take a lambda argument. You'll notice that if we implement our own functions with inline that don't explicitly take in lambda, like inline function uh, square, we want to square a certain number, and we then say x times x, then you can see uh, Android Studio, or in this case, IntelliJ, will complain that the expected performance impact from inlining is insignificant, but that does not change the fact that we have very little code here and that it would make sense in this case if we would write such a function um, to, to actually inline this code. So to not actually have a separate function call whenever we want to square a number, but just to take this code copy paste it at the place where we call this function. But that's by far not it, what inline functions actually allow us to do. One very important thing is that inline functions, due to this inlining behavior, will also grant us context on where we call them. So what do I mean with context? If we go ahead in here and we replace this with a normal for each again, and in here, or well, let's say up here, we want to launch a coroutine, dispatches default, for example, and in a coroutine, we can obviously call suspending functions. So let's say every single iteration we now want to delay by a second. So we say delay one second, but you can see it complains. It says suspension functions can only be called within a coroutine body, but we are inside of a coroutine body here. So up here, we can certainly call delay, but we get this error because this lambda function here has no context on where it's called. And we could now, of course, go ahead and make this normal for each function, a suspending function, and therefore also this action lambda a suspending function then we would have no error, but that would also mean that we could only call this normal for each function in a suspending context. But in our case, this action lambda might contain suspending code, but it does not necessarily have to. So if we just print a number here, then this is not suspending code, and we still want this to work with our for each loop. But let's quickly revert this because this is not what we want. Instead, if we swap this out with inline for each, this suddenly works even though the inline function down here is not a suspending function and this lambda specifically is also not a suspending lambda. But since the code of this function will just be copy pasted here where we call it, it will know, oh, okay, I'm actually in a coroutine scope, so I do have context to that and I can call suspending functions. Another very common use of inlining is when dealing with generics. So let's just have the absolute minimal example where we have a function callable on a generic type T and then we say t.print class name. So we just want to print the name of the class we call this on. So we'll say print line t double colon class dot simple name. But you can notice it also complains. Cannot use t as a refi type parameter, use a class instead. Because the way generics work in Kotlin is that they are that the class information is only available at compile time, but not at runtime anymore because it's erased. So at runtime, when we call this print line statement, we would have no information about the specific class instance. However, if we again make this function inline and we make this a reified parameter, then we have access to this class information of this generic type T because again, it's inlined. So this is now not a separate function call anymore when we dig into our byte code, but it's really just a print line statement at the place where we call it. And that's also where we have access to, to that actual type information. So if we um, go ahead here and we just print, uh, let's take some kind of object, hello world dot print class name. And we again take a look in our Kotlin bytecode, decompile this, take a look in our main function. You can see an object is generated for our string and here it will then have context to the string class because um, due to the inlining, it knows which specific class type is dealing with. So it can also call the simple name attribute of it and then finally print it. So this is for example, very handy when you're dealing with some kind of generic JSON conversion. So you just have a JSON string and you want to deserialize that into a certain generic object. In order to do that, you need the type information about what kind of object you're actually deserializing the JSON string into. And that again only works with reified 
which only works with inlining. But that's still not it what we can do with inline functions, because inline functions also allow so-called non-local returns. So what does that mean? If we use our normal for each function again, and we say list that for each, actually normal for each, and we say we print every single item, and let's say we now want to return after printing the first item. Then we can type return here, but we can only return the actual lambda function. Since even though we are typing the code of this lambda function in here, it's technically its own function. And inside of a function, we can obviously only return in the function where we're currently in. So technically, the code would actually be at this point where we execute this lambda. And if in this lambda we have a return statement, we can only return the lambda, but we can't return the function in which this inline for each, or here in the, where this normal for each is actually called. So here our main function. However, if we use an inlined for each again, then what we can do is we can return an inline for each, so every single uh, lambda call, but we can also have this normal return statement, which will refer to our upper function, so the main function. And if we execute this, you will notice that it will print the first number and then return out of this main function so our program will exit. But this again is only possible because we use an inline for each and the actual source code of this lambda is technically here inside of our main function. Therefore, we can also have a return statement on this main function. However, there are some exceptions where we can't use this despite of using inline. And that is, for example, if we have a function, execute async, for example, where we have a lambda function, we execute something asynchronously, by just launching a coroutine here in uh, coroutine scope, for example, dispatch as default, and then executing this action in here. If we now want to actually inline this and the lambda here, you can see we get a complaint by the IDE again. It says it can't inline action here because that may contain non-local returns. So it wants us to add this cross inline modifier to parameter action. So if we add cross inline here, then it suddenly works again. So what the heck happens here? If we, of course, launch a coroutine on a separate thread here, or we just launch a thread right away and execute our lambda in there, then from that thread or from that coroutine body, it's simply impossible to return in the function above because this execute async function will return much faster or might return much faster than the actual coroutine, which might be long running. Since launching a coroutine is something that is pretty much instant, but handling the coroutine body, depending on what it does, might take a little while. But at this point, where in this action lambda we might want to return in the um, parent function, this execute async function might have already well um, finished its execution. And that is why we have to use this cross inline keyword, which will simply say, okay, we still inline everything as usual, but we aren't allowed to have uh, non-local returns. So if we go ahead in here and we say, execute async, then in here we can't use return because if we do, you can see it says return is not allowed here. So that is already everything about the cross inline keyword. Sometimes you might also have multiple lambdas inside of, um, of a normal function where you only want to inline some of them, but not all of them, because if a function body, so a lambdas function body is probably going to be really large, then inlining also comes with a cost. And that is that the bytecode will grow a lot in size, since at every single call of this function, the code of the body will simply be copy pasted. So if you don't want to inline certain lambda functions and others you do want to, then you can use this no inline keyword. In this case, it doesn't make sense because we use inline together with a single no inline lambda, but you, if you would have multiple lambdas here, uh, you could use no inline. In general, those inline um, keywords, inline, cross inline, no inline, they're really mostly used for such utility functions to just uh, increase the performance of them a little bit. And since we as Android developers or Kotlin developers working on real projects, it's not so often that we heavily work on such utility functions, since most of the useful utility functions are already provided by the Kotlin SDK. Because of that, it's usually the case that uh, library developers benefit much more from these keywords, since they often need to write utility functions that work in a generic setting for you to use if you're using that library. But either way, I think it's super important to understand what actually happens under the hood here when using these keywords. However, we can't only inline functions, but we can also inline variables and classes. So if we go up here, what we could do is we could declare a variable that extends a certain generic type T again, specifically a list of type T's, and that refers to the last item, for example. So all we want to do is we want this variable to refer to the last item of a list when we call this. And this would work by just calling get, so retrieving an item in this list at a specific index, specifically the last index. And if we would then go ahead in here and say, want to print the list last item, and we launch this, then you will see it will print 100 because that's the last item in this list. However, if we now add the inline keyword here again, what this will do is it will simply inline the getter and setter of that uh, variable, which in the end is a function, but sometimes you will see this as an inline val, uh, so I just wanted to quickly go over that. But in the end, nothing else happens than for 
an inline function from down here that the compiler will go ahead and um, copy paste this code uh, at where we call it. So in this case, right here with our list.lastindex. And lastly, to also say something about inline classes, um, the typical cl class type that we use for that are so-called value classes, which are referring to a primitive data type, like an integer, a long, a float, that represents some kind of uh, special, maybe a limited value, however. So for example, if we wanted to store the actual number of a month, so that would have to be a value between 1 and 12, obviously, since there are only 12 different months. Then we might want to enforce to pass a specific month here to a function, to a class, and we can make use of a value class, which is a class that only consists of a single primitive parameter, which has to be annotated with a JVM inline. So here we can't yet use the inline keyword, but the behavior will be very similar. That in this case, the compiler will just go ahead and treat this as a, as a class in the scope of our well-readable Kotlin source code, but when compiling this, it will really just treat these month classes as primitive data types, so as simple integers. But we can then just uh, implement a class body where we enforce that the number can only be uh, between 1 and 12 and so on. So I hope this really gave you an idea of uh, what inline is, when it might make sense to make a function, a variable or a class inline, because I really think most people find inline confusing because it does not change anything about the behavior of our code, or at least not so obviously. So in some sense, it does change the behavior as we've seen here uh, that we can return, that we have context on um, coroutine scopes that we can call suspend functions in there, but this is not immediately obvious when you add this uh, inline keyword. So in case this is not clearer to you, then uh, please let me know that down below. And if there might be more Kotlin features that you did not understand because they are so complex, then also let me know that in the comments so I can make a video about them. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week and bye bye.